Well, so hopefully, I, you know, we'll get kind of inspired uh, through this whole several days. I'm pretty excited to be here. Um, so, yeah, so it's right in low carbon. And so, Sean asked me to talk, since we were talking about net zero energy, to also talk about carbon and kind of what does that mean. So, what I thought I'd take us to through very quickly is climate change, which I'm sure is a very new topic to all of you. Um, and you're not very familiar with it at all. Uh, talk a little bit about what that means in terms of our state goals. Talk about GHG as a metric. What does that get us? And some of the challenges and opportunities. It's a really small topic. I'll be done pretty quickly. So, I'm sorry. Um, so just down on climate change, right? What we're looking at is primarily due to anthropogenic efforts, fossil fuel use, right, that is resulting in our temperature rise. Um, and so with that, right, we're getting gases trapped, our temperature is rising, um, and it's causing a number of issues within the Earth, right? We're getting more extreme temperatures, we're getting sea level increases, stronger hurricanes, storm surges, flooding, drought, something we're pretty familiar with right now, Wildfires, if we look at uh, Southern California right now, which is not too far from, how far is it from where some of us may be in several weeks at AC Tripoli, um, and the results of the impact of that. So this issue with um, climate change resulting in increased temperatures on our planet are having these environmental impacts. And so some of you might be familiar with COP21, right, that just occurred where there was the climate, Paris Climate Accord that said, okay, we're going to prevent the temperatures rising above two degrees. And then, and then everyone came together and said, no, no, we're looking at it at one and a half degrees. So really kind of holding us to a higher bar. And what they said in terms of meeting that, it means fossil fuels must be phased out by 2055. That's really not that far away. Right? I mean, we, we'll talk about some of our state goals and kind of what that means in terms of 2020, which we have pretty aspirational goals for 2020. And 2055 is not that far away. And it takes a huge investment in infrastructure, political will, um, to actually get to that goal of, of phasing out fossil fuels. Um, one of the things, and this kind of builds on a little bit of what Sean was talking about, um, in terms of just thinking about our perspective here, so we can, I think we're probably familiar with, you know, that kind of list of environmental impacts of climate change, right? We've seen it happen. Um, but the other thing we need to think about is the health implications that come out of that, right? So climate change is very directly related to health. Um, so as we have these temperature rises, we end up with extreme heat, right? Right now, I say heat kills more people. Um, than any other disaster, okay? We've seen examples like in Europe in 2003 where there are 70 to 80,000 deaths, Russian heat wave of 2010 with 58,000, California two, 2006, that was just a mere 650, so that wasn't too bad. Which part of the Oh, I'm sorry, seven? Sorry, it's fine. I'll try to go next slide or move to the next one. Um, and so oftentimes these kind of, these extreme heat events impact more vulnerable populations. Okay, these environmental impacts are not equitable. Um, in certain cases, or in some cases, let's look at the Central Valley, drought, extreme heat, we have higher particulate matter in the air, we have issues such as airborne diseases, and valley fever is one of those. There are specific populations that are more susceptible to those respiratory diseases. And so the correctional facility there in its incredible um, health care system that it has, right? We always kind of hold the prison and correctional facility up to their health care visits, is not allowing the black populations into that correctional facility because of the susceptibility they have for respiratory disease because of valley fever. And so we're seeing this kind of happen. Um, and so, you know, I think it's just important for us to think about these issues of health and climate change. They are inextricably linked. 
Um, and as we're kind of addressing one, we are addressing the other as well. Um, yes. So I'm not valley fever. It's a respiratory disease, and so you can get it. It ends up with um, so not. In the medical I'm industry, I'm not a doctor. I have no idea. Doctor, doctor got So it's a respiratory illness that you end up that it comes from airborne particulates. So what we're seeing now, as the Central Valley is incredibly dry, right? that air quality there and it temperatures that air quality is poorer and poorer and so um you can get it's a respiratory disease i'll leave it at that yeah. um and i think you know different populations are more susceptible to different types of diseases um i was kind of let me look through my notes just to see if there's any other kind of Heartwarming stories on, on health. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to share with you guys. You mean, we're also seeing in terms of urban heat island effects, right? And so um, there are situations, right? So everyone knows what urban heat island effects are, right? More paved areas, less tree cover, less shading, higher temperatures outside those buildings. And so in some cases, and we saw this down in LA in the kind of heat wave down there, where the temperatures outside for those kids in that playground was like 120 degrees. Whoa. So what did they do? They got to stay inside because they couldn't go outside. So now our kids are staying inside. They're not outside being active. It's too hot for them to be outside. So now we're looking at less activity. So there's these linkages that we just need to be conscious of. Um, and it's the system that we're trying to address, not a single point um, of, of, I would say, energy efficiency only and climate change. So if you go to the next slide. So I put this up here because the built environment has significant impact, right? There's estimates for California, uh, the residential, uh, built environment contributing to 18, I would say up to, I've seen 26% of the greenhouse gas emissions in California. Um, we can look at how we can address that through our energy use, right, which we're gonna hear a lot about. Um, I wanna go beyond that. We can think about the C&D waste that's generated with new construction and remodel, our potable water use. Um, for us, it's like 25 to 30% um, gas use for transporting our water and distributing it, including it. Um, and our automobiles and light duty trucks, which so light duty trucks usually ends up being associated with, you know, uh, residential uh, folks. And that's like 30% of the GHGs in California. I'm going to talk about what transportation means and what does that mean to those of us that are doing housing. Because um, we're not building cars. We may be buying them, but we're not building them. So what does it mean for us? So you can go to the next slide, and I have to say, uh, I hope we're at a more optimistic point than Kurt Vonnegut. Um, <laughs> so Kurt says, and, and I have to credit um, Charlie Stevens of um, Mia, who put up the slide, we will go down in history as the first society that wouldn't save itself because it wasn't cost effective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I thought that quote was uh, excellent. So I was doing some research on it, and then back in 74, we have our grandchildren would surely think of us as planet gobblers. So I'd like to challenge us to prove Kurt Vonnegut wrong, that we can think better, um, that we won't be planet gobblers, and we can be smarter about how we are moving forward um, and and not be kind of mired in cost effectiveness. So, and talk briefly about our state goal. So now I'm on 11. Um, and most of these, obviously, we are living in this world, so our California policy decision should be pretty familiar to many of us, right? We've got AB 32 with our state mandate to get to 1990 levels by 2020. 
which is 80% below by 2050, and that's a number I'm going to focus on, or a goal I'm going to focus on for this presentation. We have our CPUC strategic plan, which is our net zero energy by 2020. We've got REACH codes and green building ordinances, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm seeing in there as an opportunity or a solution to some of these things. We've got executive orders from the governor, and we've got AB, sorry, that should be AB 758, not 8768. And so my takeaway is that what I've seen evolving in the last several years is there's a lot more focus on greenhouse gas emissions in our policies and in our programs, which is really important. And we also want to make sure that we are paying attention to it so we can do it right, and we can actually achieve our goals. Because if you go to the next slide, if I think about our energy efficiency plan and our 2020 net zero energy goals in AB 32, sometimes I'm wondering if they're at odds with each other. Are these two competing? And the reason why I say that is because when I look at our 2016 code, when I look at our 2019 code that I have not been following probably as much as I should be, so it's a bit of a caveat, it's still not driving us to reduce GHGs. It's still not driving us to essentially electrification, which I'll talk about why that's where we need to go based on several studies that have been completed to date. So we have these two state plans, state goals, and sometimes those standards are at odds with each other. So if you go to the next slide, this is from, this was released in 2011, um, California's Energy Future. And there's a recent study that was completed by E3. And um, for those going to ACCE, they're going to be presenting a paper on it. And I'll talk about that study. But essentially corroborates what this slide shows us. So if we look at this slide in front of us, that first bar is our business as usual. We keep marching along today. By 2050, we're going to be double what we are in 1990, all right? And so you can see our 1990 is about 400, so 424 million metric tons. And so if we just do efficiency, that's going to start getting us down to our 1990 level. But remember that our goal is 1990 by 2020, 80% below it by um, 2050. And so if then we get to electrification in that third bar, and you can start to see if we get to electrification, that dark blue, that's the carbon fuels, that gets a little smaller, right? Because we're kind of electrifying end uses where we can. And our electricity usage and emissions kind of goes up. So then we have to decarbonize our fuel sources. Um, and so when we think about that, and we think about kind of the pathways to get there, we can do a lot of electrification now, and it does have some impact. But we also need to make sure we're decarbonizing that source of electricity to really get that impact of, um, of reduced GHG. And so one thing to think about, you know, by 2050, if we look at as we're generating GHGs overall, right, we're building new construction, so we just want to build it better so we avoid. We have existing, we want to improve it so we reduce it. But as we look for 2050, we need to eliminate essentially nearly two pounds of GHG for every one pound that was emitted in 1990. Not a small task in front of us. Um, and if we look at not kind of getting to electrification, if we kind of take that out of the equation, we're still going to be 30% short of our goal. The other thing to note on this slide, there's that red line close to the bottom, that dotted red line, that's our 2050 target. And even doing energy efficiency, electrification, decarbonization of our fuel sources, we're still about 20% short of getting to that goal. So there's some things that we may not have uh, come to the marketplace yet. There's some new technologies. There's things that are gonna evolve over the next you know, 30 years that we will be rolling in to kind of get to that last 20%. So the next slide is taken from, um, this is the study from Energy Environmental Economics, E3. Um, 
All right, let me just let me just grab the name of this study. The technology tax is the PhD test by 2050, the pivotal role for electricity. So um, again, this is a paper on this got kind of a sneak preview and there was an article in Science Magazine on it. And so essentially this next slide is just showing electrification is needed to meet the goal and we're looking at some of the different sectors. And if we look at slide 15, the pathway to 2050. So what they have found in this recent study was energy efficiency and decarbonization of energy supply is needed. And it's rapid energy efficiency. Um, significant decarbonization, um, but then we also need electrification of transportation because we're not going to get there if that doesn't happen. Um, so kind of their models and their calculations that were run as part of this study is doubling the energy efficiency in buildings in the industry by 2030, um, switching to low carb fuel sources, so that is almost putting our fuel sources in an inverse to what they are today. We're saying 55% electricity versus 15% is what we're at today. Um, so that's a big difference. Um, and then increasing our zero energy, zero emission vehicles and hybrids to six to seven million by 2030. And then the last one, which I'm gonna talk more about, just so we can start thinking about non-energy GHGs, we need to reduce those as well. Those do have impact on our goal. Um, and so it's, really easy just to focus on energy usage um, and KWH and, and eliminating um, burns, but I also want us to think beyond that. Um, so one thing I will just point out is that um, I was looking at this study by New York, uh, in New York City. So they convene the uh, technical advisory group to evaluate carbon in New York City. And they did this incredible inventory of their buildings, and they did like 20 prototypes, and they evaluated what the emissions were. And they're looking at 70% of their emissions are coming from buildings. It's a little different than what kind of we're looking at because their transportation system is pretty darn good. They're not looking at transportation as one of their significant uh, contributors. Um, and so there, there is this need for evaluation of what is going to be most impactful and what's going to be the environment we're working in. So if we start, if we go to the next slide and start thinking about GHG as a metric and what does that get us, and we can look at slide 17 there. Um, so first we have to think about if we're looking at GHG, what potential savings do we get from different strategies, right? High, low, are we getting them today? Are we getting them tomorrow? Are we getting them in 20 years from now, right? When do we see those savings? When are they realized? Because one of the things I think, you know, is interesting if we're looking at the fact that we have to um, eliminate two pounds of CO2 for every one pound in 1990, that the sooner we do the work, the better. It's not that we want to wait and we're like, oh, we're just going to do everything right at, you know, December 31st, 2049 and be good, right? We want to be thinking about sooner and sooner than later. Um, and our opportunities here, so I just listing them and I'm going to talk about, give you some examples of them. Energy and gas use, which we're all pretty familiar with and reduction of fossil fuel use, water, vehicle miles traveled, embodied energy, and we, you know, mentioned kind of the resulting uh, impacts on health. Um, one of the things I think is interesting about addressing GHGs is we also have to be careful of what, you, what we can quantify and what we cannot quantify. Um, and I think health is one of them where we know there's benefits there. It's been really challenging to make that correlation of energy efficiency and health impact and quantify that. There's a number of folks, some of us in the room, some of us who are working with other folks in the room who are trying to gather research and demonstrate that and, and tie that quantification um, because that quantification allows investment to happen um, and find more work to occur in that arena. Yes, sir. Your information would include uh, conversion of recursion to non-GHG recursion? Give me not? five slides. Okay. Sorry. Awesome. <laughs> I don't know if it's really five, but it's somewhere in there. Yeah. We'll count. Yeah, I'm sorry. I already think I'm wrong. But. <laughs> um, so I was also mentioning kind of timing of, of, uh, is of the essence. And I did take this slide from Energy Environmental Economics. I want to make sure that 
not the not the text, but the graph there. But what I like about what they did on this graph, if you look at it, you know, they're listing a number of impacts on that left hand bar. You know, hot water heating, space heating, um, industrial boiler, and they're looking at those number of replacements. So we think something for us to be conscious of is what are we locking in now? When we're building our buildings today, what emissions and impacts are we locking in today? And how long are we locking them in for? Um, so uh, one of the things I've talked with a number of local jurisdictions, right, they're doing developments and planning approval that are not going to break ground for probably at least another five years. And they're like, and I'm permitting it and approving it today. It's just to code today. And in five years, it's probably not, it's not going to meet the code, but this is what I am after. And so how do I do that? And the property owners and developers, and those of you in the room can contribute to this, and this has been um, found in New York as well, they said, well, how do we build if there's this moving target? How do we plan that far ahead? And so we need to start thinking about that. If we're trying to kind of make sure we're building high quality housing when in the future and we're approving it today, how do we make that happen? Um, so New York is going through this process of figuring out how to support property owners and developers with this long-term planning as well as financial solutions that support it. So the last that I wanna take us through is some opportunities and challenges. Now I'm on slide one again. So, cap and trade, right? With our cap and trade, we have a number of uh, programs that are actually being funded in disadvantaged communities um, for housing. But one of the things that I thought was interesting, and you know, I probably know enough about this to be really dangerous. Um, Right, we have the cap and trade. The intent is to make sure us as a state and rate payers aren't just kind of bearing that burden, allow some flexibility within a business, right? Well, but the thing is, you can look at like somebody like Chevron who is increasing their emissions by 20% since like 2011, and they're offsetting it with investment in forests in Northern California as well as investment in um, methane uh, digesters in cattle ranches in Indiana. So I'm not sure how much that's helping kind of the Richmond area, right? So there's this tension there in some of the cap and trade, and I'm not sure what the magic answer is, but I'll talk about a couple things that I've been learning about. Um, one, there's a 2015 federal study that said the minimum price for carbon to encourage innovation, not offset necessarily, right, but innovation where it is is 37, and $37 per ton. And Stanford School of Earth Sciences did a study, and I think it was last year, so uh, was 220. Now, we have to dig into those assumptions and kind of what we're understanding, but Regardless, 37 or $220, our cap and trade program is doing 11 to $14 a ton. So we have a disparity kind of right there in terms of we don't want to, we would like things to be funding innovation, not paying for offsets necessarily. Um, there's a recent bill, SB 197, that's asking for the full societal co carbon, cost of carbon emissions in the regulatory, future regulatory decisions, and also pushing for improvement on site. So there's work that's happening in this area um, by folks who kind of really want to be pushing that through. Um, but anyway, that it's, it's an opportunity and a challenge for us, right? This, this funding that can fund housing in disadvantaged communities or these other programs that are supporting that, but how do we do it in, in a way that we're also um, looking at the, the surrounding health impacts and not kind of supporting pollution. The next one thinking about is a shift in economics of our code. So the two biggest things as we're looking at the evaluation of reducing greenhouse gas emissions is reducing our fossil fuel use, right? So we've got to get off fossil fuel, but there's a couple things that are a little bit challenging for us. Um, and there are a number of initiatives and proceedings that are underway. One is our time-dependent valuation. 
it's gonna be adjusted for our 2019 code, and some of you may know more about that adjustment than I do. Um, we also, in 2016, we're gonna be seeing our energy design rating of zero, that is based on time-dependent valuation, which is not cost-effective to get to for a electric and gas house. So that's an interesting kind of thing for us to think about. Um, we have a three-pronged test for fuel switching. The challenge I think with this is a lot of these decisions we're making in terms of, I would say, net zero energy electrification are system-based. I'm not making this decision based on changing one appliance out for the other, but that's what we're looking at with the three-pronged test. So along with, you know, we need to be thinking about a full evaluation um, to try to, you know, kind of push that on getting to be able to do fuel switching. Um, in our 2016 code, we do have uh, tank of domestic hot water as our baseline and one inch gas line. Um, so there's this kind of uh, support for gas infrastructure kind of built in. Um, and so one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, how do we start really thinking about that true cost of the gas infrastructure, right? Whether it's getting it from the street to the door for that new house I'm building, Right? What does it cost to run that line? What is it for that meter? Or if I'm looking at areas out in the Central Valley that don't have gas, if I'm running a gas line, what's really the true cost of that gas infrastructure? What about the maintenance of it over time? We know it needs maintenance, and we know what happens if you don't have the maintenance of it. Um, in Vermont recently, they were looking at expanding the gas line, and um, they were proposing this expansion and stakeholders kind of brought this issue and pushing them to kind of have an apples to apples evaluation to make sure that what is that cost of that gas line expansion? What is the cost of that infrastructure? What does it cost to maintain it? And so while the proposal didn't go away and it's still kind of approved, but they may not go through it, um, but they raise the level of awareness. So it's now part of the dialogue, which I think is really important. Um, lastly, uh, the other piece is the thing about increasing the support of renewables. Um, I think even the Energy Commission and the CPC would say we still don't have enough solar to kind of meet our goal, but yet we have this tension of solar and grid management, so that's a little bit of an issue. We also still have things in our code, like there's no PV credit for climate zone six and seven because there's not enough heating and cooling load there. I don't know. I think there's domestic hot water load there. I think there's lighting. <laughs> so how, how do we start kind of looking at this so we can we can create more opportunity to support renewables? One of the things I'm seeing next slide on 22 is local solutions. And I've been talking a lot with local governments uh, throughout the state. And what's kind of exciting, at least for me, is the driving factor for them to adopt codes or ordinances above code is climate action planning. Now, last year under the 20, not last year, but previously, we're still under 2013 code, but under the 2013 code, it was a really challenging rollout. Local jurisdictions just kind of shrunk down and tried to figure out how they're going to kind of weather that storm. And we weren't looking at building above code. Now, as we look forward to 2016, I'm having conversations with local jurisdictions that said, okay, what's my energy efficiency goals? All right, let's get there. How can I have a PV ordinance? How can I have an electrical vehicle ordinance? Are there things I can do about water? Really? What can I do with water? Don't we have a strength in the code stuff already? So, we're starting to see um, a lot more interest there, which I think is um, David, really exciting. One point I wanted to bring up is that with the current code, that there's such serious impediments to uh, electrification and use of the constant grid if a jurisdiction such as Palo Alto, who I talked to about this, adopts a reef code, it might make use of heat pumps and electrification impossible with, with the current structure of the code. Yeah. Um, so a couple things that because our baseline in the current code is is gas, so that how heat pumps are recognized in our compliance software, 
to make it challenging, is your point, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, you're, so you can model it, and I think you guys have done some evaluations where you're not even hitting minimum code, mm -hmm. right? Um, and yeah, so, our new and buildings are, some of them are not meeting the 2016 code. So code, they're baseline. They're not good enough. They're zero to energy, but 2016 code will say no. Right, so, because no, the, build, the baseline. The building's not good enough, but the code's not good enough. Exactly. Right. To Amy's point, I'm calling the 2016 code a dash code. It is a strongly focused dash baseline, reduces the electric allowance for the building, which forces you to do dash. And I want to shoot myself for here because this is an all electric property, and we're the rebellion movement. Right. So, so it is a challenge. I think there is some movement that's happening to include it, and you guys, I think, are in, involved in it that we're starting to see some work on heat pump water heaters where the credit within the compliance software is going up and getting closer and maybe surpassing the tankless on demand. Um, there's also work that's happening with ductless mini slips to try to get credit. That's probably not going to happen for a while. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like to your point, we're going to have this tension with code compliance as well as trying to go above uh, code. Uh, yeah, so, so well, as I said, in Palo Alto, they, they specifically, the community group, uh, I think, successfully blocked a reach code that would have, well, what a reach code is something that requires a, a higher level of performance and efficiency than would be required at the state level. And they, they blocked the city implementing this higher code because it would have made electrification impossible. So, as you're saying, we can work with us yeah. in terms of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Then you just start time frame. Yes. Yes. I'm going, going. All right. I'll go, quick, I'll go quickly through these next things. So, and I'm sorry, I still don't know everybody's name by Saturday, but you were asking about refrigerant cars. Um, so, the next slide on 23. Um, previously, when I was doing, when I, I'm still doing work on, on green building certification, but, you know, one time we used to have R22, and that got replaced by our 410A. They probably had pretty similar global warming potential in terms of that number there. I think R22 might be a little bit less, but it had significantly higher ozone depletion um, impact. But then if we look all the way down there at the bottom at CO2 and the opportunity for um, air to water heat pump systems, right, or heat pump water, CO2 heat pump water heaters, our global warming potential is uh, quite a bit lower than our 410A. So we're seeing these products come out. Um, they're not fully kind of in the market. Um, our California Air Resources Board has put out a proposal to phase out uh, 410A by 2021. So we'll see kind of where that puts us. But again, the, so this portion of the presentation, I'm going to go through pretty quickly because I have to wrap up. But these are just looking at elements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that are non-energy. So they're not really focused on our energy or direct KWA concern. So the next one is water. Um, really challenging to make this cost effective by 24. Um, but what I like about it is if we start thinking about our site, you know, from source all the way to treatment, we go to slide 25, we can see that there is a very different impact of our water use. So, you know, water to Los Angeles is about four times the GHG impact as it is to my house in Oakland. Most of I am, most of mine is gravity fed from the McCollum. LA is not. Um, UC Davis has done an evaluation of water efficiency and gray water for landscape only and saw the payback from one to eight years. Okay, so that's getting into maybe more palatable payback period. Uh, the PUC built a building, uh, one of their buildings, where black water, it's a commercial building, or civic building, uh, black water is more cost effective than doing gray water because they had to do cast iron over three stories, and so they didn't want to do a plump. And so they have an on-site black water treatment system, and that the water from that treatment system is used to flush the toilet. So we're seeing different ways things are cost effective. Um, next couple of slides are about embodied emissions and material. Um, and I'm going to, again, try to keep going quickly. Um, one of the things is just trying to think about our material selection, because those are the first emissions that that building is going to contribute, mm -hmm. what materials are in it. 
And so I knew that little chart from Larry's screen to the right is probably microscopic. You guys can always enlarge it. But the first row there, that first orange line, is the impact of concrete. And the amount of concrete that's typically you know, in our buildings. And if we look at lower kind of carbon footprint concrete or eliminating it from our structural uses and being more conscious of our structural use of it, we can really see that go down. Um, so we really can, you know, we can start thinking about material choices and how that reduces our greenhouse gas emissions. The other one is insulation. Um, and essentially, if we just stay away from XPS and um, uh, closed cell spray polyurethane, then we're good, right? Then we're good. Those two have really high uh, building global warming potential. You can see on the next slide in the chart um, where those paybacks are like 30 plus years and all the other installations are probably in like two to five or seven. Next slide on plug-in electric vehicles. Um, the reason why I want to talk about this again, not because we're building cars, but because we're building homes and if we're going to reach our target of electrifying our transportation and looking at ARB's goals for 1.5 million cars on the road by 2050 and 900,000 charging points, then we got to have that infrastructure there. So again, I said local jurisdictions are looking at creating you know, ordinances for this. So on the single family side, run the circuit, have it available. Doesn't matter who's going to live there, make it available, right? On the multifamily and non-residential side, they're looking at preparing to have that infrastructure there, the conduit. Some people are pulling circuits, have the spaces. That is cost effective. You don't have to do it later. And then, you know, as the market is evolving, maybe as prices are available, we've got the infrastructure to support it and we're not trying to retrofit it later. Um, and there's significant CHGs that we can look at from reducing our petroleum. The next slide, just on Greenpoint rated, um, again, and kind of my effort to think beyond just energy impacts of CHGs. We are quantifying the DHG impacts of green buildings, so obviously energy efficiency, but we're also looking at it in terms of reduced home size, how much material are you putting in that home, smaller home, less impact, right? Um, waste recycling and waste diversion, that is the highest impact of greenhouse gas emissions on a, when a project is under construction. Um, and then again, like I said, new construction avoids, so we want to generate less with new construction and existing we want to reduce. And let's see, in the effort, and because I saved time, the next two slides, I'm not going to go through them, but they're just a table there to think about standard choices versus choices you may be looking at or making if you're thinking about CHG. Um, so if we go to 32, there's just some opportunities there of new construction versus existing, which I'm sure we'll hear a lot about some of those um, opportunities over the next couple days. Um, right, avoiding GHGs, getting stuff integrated into the design. On the existing side, oftentimes we're looking at uh, operations and reducing that. Um, there can be more barriers to retrofitting existing based on the existing infrastructure. And in some cases, on the new construction side, it can be the same cost for GE as standard construction. So, slide 33 and 34 are just talking about our co benefits of energy efficiency and clean energy. So, again, it's just bringing us back to we can have our energy efficiency, we can have clean energy, it's going to improve our environment, and it can also have health impacts. Right, of reducing asthma, respiratory disease, allergies. Um, so we want to think about those. And then active transportation code benefits. Again, we, if we think about transportation as being an issue, and again, what does that have to do with housing? It has to do with where we're locating it, what services are available. Do we have biking and walking accessible to the developments we're building? Do we have electrical vehicle charging infrastructure or the possibility for that if those occupants have those, those vehicles in the future? Because all of those can have impacts on reduced air pollution, noise, infrastructure costs. It can increase social mobility within that community, activity, um, which then can have impacts on health, respiratory, obesity. Um, and one of the things I didn't mention kind of is, is mental health. And as we look at some of these health impacts from greenhouse gas emissions or displacement, um, respiratory disease, it can also be very stressful for folks. 
so we can have these inner benefits. So the last slide I want you to skip over pretty quickly. It just says define your zini lens. This is like an ongoing discussion. Actually, you know, however you want to define it, you can define it uh, through build a green and green permitted. We are looking, you know, right now we're looking at a site. We're looking at it as all electric. Um, but on the last slide there, I just want to make sure over the next couple of days we kind of come back to this conversation. And as we're thinking about all the work that we're doing, all the amazing projects that we're doing, then we just kind of put a little lens of carbon on there. And just ask ourselves, is there something else we can be doing? Is there something else we should be doing? Would we do something differently? And it's not to put us into paralysis because we can't address everything. Um, I'm kind of resistant to the zero carbon term um, just because I don't know how to quantify all the carbon in a, in a building, right? Just as we can also argue about zero net energy, right, and what your definition is. So I think of like low carbon, um, but let's not let us put it into like a paralysis, but have us think about what our opportunities are.